So uh, this is actually a, a good slide for this to start off with. It's put together this talk uh, for a, uh, my time in Argentina with my students, so an undergraduate research student, uh, as you'll see, Ricardo uh, Ely, uh, who's now in a uh, graduate program, University of Indiana, and so students, he got a full ride to go there, so undergraduate research does pay off. <laughs> Okay. But what we want to look at or pay attention to is right here because that's where this particular fossil, where it was, the Deinonychosaur, where we found it in 2003. Okay. And so the, we'll be talking about sort of in the second half of the talk, the sediments, the kinds of things you see up here where we found that hadrosaur. All right. And then through the rest of this uh, Cape Lamb member type of deposits, um, uh, then there have been a number of different dinosaurs that have found in different locations, so we'll talk about that a bit. But one thing, when you look at all of these rocks, this is ocean bottom. This isn't land back at this time. And so we find this interesting collection of dinosaurs that somehow have gotten floated off the peninsula, which was land, and then out into this ocean bottom. And we'll talk about why we see sort of the unique kinds of parts that we find, and uh, sometimes are missing the things that are most diagnostic. Okay. All right, so, uh, so we're sponsored by grants from the National Science Foundation. If you're gonna work in Antarctica here in the US, that's the only way you get there. Is, is through them. And then I was lucky enough to, to get this uh, visiting professorship and to work with my colleagues in Argentina this past summer. So their school year, because it was winter, so got to interact with students there. So I had a great time. So where I'm going to take you is a place probably most of you haven't seen, is sort of this is the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. And at one time, that was connected through an isthmus to Tierra del Fuego in South America, right? So a continuous corridor then from South America to Antarctica. And a question we're starting to look at right now is when does this corridor break? And then what is the influence once you don't have continents to the north bringing warm water down to Antarctica? Then we know by the time around 35 million years ago, things get cold everywhere, sets off that sort of ice house conditions at the beginning of the Oligocene. So we're in that, in a particular area, the James Ross Basin. So the big island of James Ross. Seymour Islands, where people have done some work a long time. So the mammals we talked about, the Eocene mammals come from there. And that's how I originally got started as a graduate student going down with my professor, Mike Woodburn, from UC Riverside. And so we continued to find more mammals and and both marsupials and placental ungulate mammals. A lot of work by our colleagues from Argentina and a wonderful collection of types of things. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us anything about marsupials that wind up making their way to Australia to be that unique fauna. That's really the part of the question I wanted to, to answer. And when I took over the project from Mike uh, in the late 1970s, we moved from working on Seymour Island over to this area here, over on Vega, Cape Lamb first. And with that, if you come go back into the last part of the Cretaceous, dinosaurs are there. And what we're hoping is to find mammals. We haven't had much success there yet, but one of the other big news is that we have the first records of true modern birds in the Cretaceous, and where they occur first is here in Antarctica. Okay. All right. So why then, of all the dinosaurs that have been found in this area, is because what we are close to at this time is the Paleo shoreline. All right. So there are wonderful Cretaceous deposits down here on this south part of Seymour Island. Matter of fact, there's a wonderful what was KT boundary, now KPG boundary, okay, there. Uh, and they've looked at a number of different groups to look at patterns of extinction across that boundary. But as far as looking at vertebrates, that's mid-shelf out here 
where we're close to the paleo shoreline here because the land surface is here at the Antarctic Peninsula. All right. So anything that we find represents vertebrates that have been floated out if they're not marine reptiles. And we get very large numbers of marine reptiles, uh, plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, as part of things that we get to find. Mm -hmm. All right, the only down part to all this is you've got to take one of these and you've got to take it from Tierra del Fuego to the peninsula across the Drake Passage and that is probably one of the worst places in the world to travel, <laughs> right? Because you just get these huge currents that go from the Pacific to the Atlantic, all kinds of storms, and uh, having made numerous trips via ship to go across, you may get lucky on one crossing, but you'll never get lucky on both. You'll hit a storm someplace, and it gets rather uncomfortable going across. We dearly love going down with our Argentine colleagues where we get to fly down. So instead of three and a half days on a ship, you have three and a half hours in the air, and then you arrive on uh, the Argentine base on Seymour Island, and then helicopter over to the island. Much preferable as far as things did to that. And you'll see some other reasons why here in a moment. But NSF tries to maximize kinds of things. And here's one of my colleagues from Argentina who joined us. We had joined their camps in the past. And so we had some Argentines uh, with us. But Dan Blake had another group. He's an invertebrate paleontologist, works a lot on echinoderms. And so he was working on Seymour in the Eocene. And then there was another group, sort of the guys standing here, there, who were working on pelagic birds. And so they were doing work down and back on the cruise. So they try to maximize on any cruise how many projects can fit in to sort of take more advantage on the transportation down there. But for us, trying to get there is you run into this stuff. This is sea ice. These are part of those ice shelves you've been reading around that break off. And then the winds blow them and they clog up trying to get through one side of the peninsula from the uh, Atlantic side to get through into the Weddell Sea side, that is on that eastern side, where we want to get. So after finally making it through all this stuff in this year, in 2003, we were early. We went down. We left at just before Thanksgiving. And so got down here sort of right at the end of November, beginning of December. And what we saw was this. This is different. This is the sea being frozen. So that's solid. That's you know kind of stuff you go ice fishing on. And I dig the hole through. And what it meant was we wanted to get there, but the ship couldn't get there. Okay. And so what, what to do? And so where we wound up going, so here's where we wanted to go, but a lot of this whole area through around here was completely frozen solid. And the ship just couldn't break through because there was no place for the ice to go. Right? It's completely wedged in. So the only open water was down around this area, and so that's as close as we could get to any deposits that looked like this stuff over on Cape Lamb, where we wanted to go. Right? So at least we know we're looking in the same kind of deposits, same age, just over on James Ross Island instead of over here on Vega. Okay. And this is what we do. We camp. So we don't have a nice Antarctic station that's cozy and warm, all right? So we have a variety of our tents. We do have a main tent. That is something we started doing because early on, when everybody was cooking for, in pairs, you'd find out by the end of the field season, you lost some weight. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it meant that day by day, your productivity went down. You just were getting tired. You weren't taking in enough calories. So as soon as we start having a communal tent for cooking, somebody's working closer to camp any given day, is the cook for the day, and everybody has a good hot meal at the end of the day. And it completely changed sort of how we got along. Unfortunately, this site here, you have to go all the way around here, and this is part of the area we wanted to work. And that's about four and a half to five miles. 
Okay. And it's a tough because a lot of this place that was where we could walk, we were actually walking over the ocean on ice that was coming out off the land surface and would change day to day as things were starting to melt as they were heading towards the middle of their summer. Okay. All right. So here's the Cape Lamb sequence. We'll talk a little bit about sandwich buffs. So this is over in Vega. So what we're seeing is the same kind of deposits. And all this stuff is, for the most part, loosely consolidated. That is, until you hit permafrost where the ice has frozen it. You, it's really good. You can sieve this stuff. It's fine. But you can only go down so far, and then it's like cement. And then you have to wait for it to melt a little bit more the next day. And then you can work down a little hard. So it's really hard to dig something big out of the ground. It's, it's kind of coming back every day, doing a little bit uh, down there. OK. So part of the things we're going to talk about is there's the Cape Lamp. That's where we've done most of the work. Well, our Argentine colleagues have worked in the Herbert Sound member although they refer to it as the gamma member. So you'll hear those, both of those terms. So that's the older part. And then Sandwich Bluff, that part of the top, that's where we found the, the hadrosaur, which was the first of the dinosaurs down there. OK. All right. Now, Antarctica then, the end of the Cretaceous, does it look like it looks now. OK. It's green. And it would be green all year round. So these are all, nearly all, evergreen type plants that are there. And most of what we see as far as trees are southern hemisphere gymnosperms. Okay, things like Araucaria, Norfolk pines we see at Christmas time, a lot of those, uh, things called podocarps. There's lots of ferns that are there. So there's actually a lot of vegetation for dinosaurs to eat, and it would be there all year round. So we really have a difficulty trying to think of ecosystems where it's dark all day, right? And yet you've got greenery around, okay? And so what we see from the plants and, 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 uh, is that they don't, they have weird growth rings, all right? So you see the tree rings, lots of what we would call spring wood, and then it sort of ends abruptly. It just stops, there's no growth. And so the ring, that summer wood kind of thing, is really thin, and then it starts into spring wood. So it's all mediated by light more than it is by temperature. Okay. One of the things that we don't see in any of the wood from the Eocene all the way back into the Cretaceous is we see no frost rings. So what we're not seeing are freezing temperatures. The temperatures are actually fairly mild. Right? So they're cool temperate. They're certainly not like they are today. Okay. Right. So dinosaurs wouldn't necessarily have to migrate anywhere. They could be there, here, but they would be spending part of that year in the dark. Mm -hmm. So it leads to questions, how do, how do then the carnivores hunt? Because the herbivores don't have to leave. Doubt that the carnivores would have left. Okay. So some of the things that we have. So this is one of the earliest ones found by the British, and that was found on Cape Lamb, right? So we'll be talking about more of our Hypsilophodon, one of the oldest of the dinosaurs that come from down there, so lowest down in the column, was found by our Argentine colleagues. It's a notosaur. So notosaurs and ankylosaurids are those group of armored, squatty dinosaurs, but notosaurs don't have the big triangular head, they have no club on their tail. Okay, so a little more primitive, but turns out that this notosaur that we have is a basal notosaur. That is, it comes from the bottom of the family tree for that particular family. Okay, some of the newer finds are these guys. That is, small ornithopods, not that hypsilophodont, something closer to iguanodontids, which are then close to hadrosaurs, duckbill dinosaurs. So a couple have been found uh, in the Cape Lamb deposits that we have and in that Santa Marta Cove, Lake Campanian, close by where our notosaur came from. And then we do get big things down there, but we don't have much of the big things. But Titanosaurs 
are particular clade of sauropods that have some dermal armor in their skin. Okay? And they're very prevalent in the southern hemisphere, and at only right at the end of the Cretaceous do we see them arrive in North America. Okay? But we have some material to know that we have a titanosaur. And then sort of the last, the youngest of the dinosaurs we have is the hadrosaur that we found up in Sandwich Bluff. For me, this was the encouraging part because this is a North American immigrant. Okay. There's a couple of taxa found in Patagonia, in Argentina, and then we have ours down in uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. So for me, this is a North American immigrant, and our marsupials are North American immigrants. So this is what said, aha, if we found this here, the likelihood I can find some of those marsupials that would be on that trek to Australia. So we're still hoping. So keep your fingers crossed, please. So, so far, everything that had been found in it are, are all herbivores, till in 2003, we came across this one. Okay. So we could tell, if, so the first thing is that when I came across the original fossils, one, I knew they were terrestrial because they're not sort of the real rounded kind of bones that we see in the articulating joints that we have in marine reptiles. These were very angular. So we've got a dinosaur. Yay. Okay. As we've collected more and more of the material, then we started actually finding some teeth and looking at the claws and things we found. We knew we had a meat-eating dinosaur or a theropod. Okay. After a number of years of looking at it, trying to figure out what kind, because it had some real sort of primitive features to it, decided, I decided, let's put it that way, and colleagues, that it was a dromaeosaurid. So things like Velociraptor from the movies, okay, that kind of thing. Only ours was actually the size they showed in the movie, where real Velociraptors are much smaller. They're sort of, sort of big dog size, not big people size, okay, all right. So, so we have a large raptor that's down there of some kind, okay. But I'm a mammal person, not a dinosaur person. I know a lot more about birds than dinosaurs. So we really need somebody to go through and thoroughly look at a lot of the material that we have. And most of the material I have have to do with the feet. So we've got Lots of material, nearly all the parts of it, to have a fairly complete foot from one side, and we got about a half a foot from the other side. Okay? We have some bits of the head and little bits of the tail. So those are the sort of non-tasty bits that something like a mosasaur wouldn't eat. So we feel that when this carcass floated out, probably had some big chunks taken out of the middle by some mosasaur, and what was less for us to find were all those pieces you wouldn't eat off something anyway. Right? You're not gonna eat the head, you're not gonna eat the feet, and probably not eat much of the tail, okay? So, Ricardo was faced with this challenge to do an anatomical description of it. We hadn't gone through and done a thorough kind of phylogenetic analysis, and I want him to examine the question, was this really a dromaeosaur, or is it something else? All right, and not to feel pressured by his professor that this is what it is, right? Okay, so what he was able to find in examining, doing a lot of detail of looking at the anatomy is there were some really odd things about it that didn't correlate well with it being a raptor, okay? So one of the things, the first things he noticed is, so this is the end of the foot bone that's going to be towards that second digit where that big claw comes from, okay? And if you're looking at other raptors, this surface in here should have two sort of condyles on it and a groove in the middle so that the first toe bone before you get to the claw has a groove to sit in and is well anchored in that groove. We don't see this. That meant that the toe would have been like the other's toes in sort of a cup over that and much less stable. So we don't have a gingivoidal those things with the two condyles in the groove. 
type of articulation here. And that scene in all drove me a swords, okay? But not ours. So that was one of the first things. The next thing is that we have an unusual relationship between the astragalus and the ankle, you have the same thing, and the tibia here, is that for most theropods, there's a big process that extends up and actually has a big indentation or it's completely fused onto the tibia. We don't see either of that. The process is short and there's no sign of any kind of real articular surface on the tibia at all. So this is very primitive. It is, there are different kinds of dromaeosaurids and closely related family, truodontids, that have short ascending processes on the stragglers, right? But they're all basal members, and it's an unusual characteristic for meat-eating dinosaurs in general. So that was the second one. And then the oddity is this is the calcaneus that, if the astragalus was complete, would sit on the end of it, but it's fused to the fibula. And this is an oddity among dinosaurs, right? So we have something very peculiar about our, our theropod that's here anyway. And some things just don't fit well with other dromaeosaurids, okay? The last major piece was that is the size of the claw for a velociraptor. So a dromaeosaurid that's half the size of what ours is. There's our claw. That's the back end compared to that, okay? Now, some truodontids have small, I mean, they're enlarged, but they're not hypertrophied, okay? So that what we have is one of the forms where we have a large claw, doesn't look like the average normal claw that most other theropods would have on that second toe. So we've got that upright toe with a bigger claw on it, but it's nowhere close to what you see in typical dromosaurids and many truodontids as well, okay? So we've, we, we've got a raptor with a tiny claw, okay? All right. So unusual again. All right, so this was part of the project that actually took both of us a long time, was trying to find a good data set. Because there's lots of data sets, lots of data sets that have a lot more taxa, we still had 86, all right? And ones that had a lot more characters, but they were talking about parts of the body we just didn't have. But this one by Zing, coming out of, of China look, and Mongolia, looking at some of their, both raptors and truodontids, had a lot of pedal characters. And so that's why we chose this one to compare against because there were gonna be more characters that we could relate from our dinosaur to other dinosaurs, okay? So it would give us a much better idea where the dinosaur might fit. So we used PALP to run this, <coughs> and we also did, we'll show you some results from the bootstrapping analysis to see if the initial hypotheses of the trees we were getting had any substance or not, okay? So, you can't read anything on this, right? So that's what I put the color things on here. And then we'll simplify this in a minute. But to say there were our 86 taxa. Okay, so this is where our theropod came out. This is the Truodontidae. This is the Dromaeosauridae. So these are these raptor kinds of animals. So they are sister groups to each other. And the first thing outside of that is our theropod. Okay, so if we look at a simplified version of this, is that depending on whose data set people want to look at, about 60% of the time, this relationship where dromaeosaurids and truodontids, which have many sort of bird-like characters, but still have many of the raptor kind of characters as well, are sister groups to each other, and then birds are the sister group to both of those. So this arrangement is the Dinocosauria, based from the Deinonychus from North America here, okay? So other types of studies with different databases, sometimes we'll take dromaeosaurids and have them to the sister group to birds. Others will have truodontids as a sister group to birds. But in about 60% of all the analyses that are done, 
Dinosauria comes out, that these two raptor-like groups are each other's closest relatives. So now when we include our, our theropod, it is the sister group to these, much closer to these than they are to birds. Okay. So we felt pretty good about this as we looked at a number of, of trees that kind of gave us the same things and mixed up other taxa up in the trees. And so when we did a, yeah, go ahead. No, is, is that bodies, fossils, things you can identify other than isolated teeth start from the early Cretaceous for both groups. And they both start in the Mongolia, China area. So both have their origins there. And then um, dromaeosaurids come early to North America and are on many continents around the world. Truodontids, less so. They spent a long time in Asia, and most of their diversity is there. We do see them in the last part of the Cretaceous here in North America, and you get them sort of right at the very end of the Cretaceous in Europe. Okay. So biogeographically, they don't have as big a range as what the dromaeosaurids do. They're, they're sort of everywhere. They're in South America. They're in Africa. So they have a wide range where they go. Okay. All right. So. Our nasotheropod theropod is now part of this group. Okay. And in running bootstrap, now we've got a pretty good value. Over 70% of every time the iterations come back, it says it's related to these. It collapses the branch between these two and includes our theropod as part of that. So we felt pretty good that what we have is a basal deinonychosaur. Okay. Now, What's interesting, there's not very many taxa that ever fit into that compartment, okay? So that this makes the specimen rather interesting and unique and has stimulated interest now from other people. So we feel pretty confident we have a basal dinonychosaur, right? So we're happy about that. It gives us something interesting, but it adds to some of the interesting things when we look at some of those other groups the notosaur is at the bottom of its tree. This is sort of the bottom of the tree for dinonychosaurs. All right. Those elasmerian ornithopods are at the bottom of the tree for there. So something's interesting about the fauna that we have, that we have so many of these early forms of the tree still existing sort of at the end of the age of dinosaurs in Antarctica and no place else. So, we're also one of the places, it's the, one of the last places to get flowering plants. So we still have those old early Cretaceous type of environments and we have a lot of these what would be sort of more early Cretaceous type things in other places still in Antarctica at the bottom of the world. So that's part of maybe the reason we're, we're sort of a refugia or, or a relic kind of distribution for these kinds of dinosaurs. All right. All right. So this is where I found the first bones, and then the whole group sort of wound up coming over. We collected lots of stuff. We screened the whole area for a big pat, so we found everything we could at the time. Um, colleague Matt Lamana went back uh, this past season. He wound up being able to get back and come, came back with some more material. So we're in the process of describing some of this new material now. Okay. So this is our section. So we had about 90 meters in the section of Cape Lamb deposits there. And about in the middle is where that dinotosaur came from. But equally important for us to figure out how our dinosaur relates in time to other dinosaurs has to do with the ammonites that are there. So at the bottom, we have this ammonite Gunnerides antarcticus. And up at the top, we have Kitchenites. And you can see the difference in its form. And even more unusual is this heteromorphic, sort of paperclip-shaped ammonite called Diplomasrus. And that is the most important one as far as trying to correlate between 
our Cape Lamb in Cape Lamb over on Vega, where the reference section is. Okay. Not only do we find that, but we also find this bivalve pinna, and we have this decapod, so crab-like thing that's very lobster-looking. Okay. And these are all, all of those things are part of what's known as the Gunnerides assemblage zone in that reference section over on Cape Lamb. So if we look at that section, we can see Hoploparia. One thing we haven't found yet is this nautiloid, Eutrophoceros, but there's Pinna as part of that, and then the Ammonites of Diplomoceros, Kitchenites, and Gunnerides. Okay. There's also our colleagues from the British Antarctic Survey have a strontium date of 71 million right around the top of this zone where you find Diplomoceros. It's in a very limited portion of all that assemblage zone, and that's important. The other important feature is that we have, in various places where we were and over on Cape Lamb itself, we can see Cape Lamb in contact with that Herbert Sound or Gamma member underneath. So we also know what kind of ammonites are in there, and this becomes important. Okay. So here's our reference section over on Cape Lamb, and this was mostly done by Duncan Peary and his colleagues from the British Antarctic Survey, and it's sort of the, the study everybody now sort of puts their data into. So this is where that Hypsilophodont dinosaur was found, and it's right at the top of that Diplomoceros zone. Okay. We have Diplomoceros as uh, that one of those ornithopods, Morosaurus, found also on the Nays Peninsula, but about 30 meters below us, but they're still in the Diplomoceros zone. So all three of these dinosaurs come from this 50 meters block of section. So that puts all of those three dinosaurs roughly around 71 million years ago. Right. So at least we're able to tie the stuff from on the Nays here. So the Morosaurus comes from back here, part of the Nays. Our stuff from, came from out here and then from Cape Lamb itself. Because of the ammonites are there, we're able to correlate and put all three dinosaurs in this section around 71 million years ago. So, yay, we felt good about that, okay. Now, if you go down into Herbert Sound, you can find the first arrival of Gunnerides there in Herbert Sound on Vega, as well as Herbert Sound over at the Santa Marta Cove area. And we also have this other ammonite called Neogramides. So these two, this association of those two, the beginning of Gunnerides and Neogramides, are found across this basin. So they're found in many different kinds of areas and serve sort of as a good marker from place to place to place to know where you are. That means you're very high up, you know, the very top of that Herbert Sound or Gamma member. Okay. So we have this over on Cape Lamb. So now, here's the three other dinosaurs that come from this slightly older sequence in Santa Marta Cove, right? So this is the Titanosaur right here, and then down at the bottom, this is our Notosaur. This is the other ornithopod here. And all of them basically occur in areas where we have very few ammonites, but right on top here is where we pick up the Neogramides and Gunnerides. They're back. So that means that these are, this represents the very topmost portion of that Herbert Sound or Gamma member. This is just below it. So now we can take this section and correlate it to our section over here because this top part is the same top part we have here because we have this collection of ammonites. Same ammonites, both places. All right. So this is going to be the latest Campanian 
here's what the boundary is thought to be at 71.3 and then we've got here. So what this puts is about that all six of those dinosaurs probably occur in a range of about two million years. All part of the same fauna. And now from my visit to Argentina, we find that up where the hadrosaur came from, we now have some ankylosaur material, that is this guy down here, an Artopelta, and we have some of that elasmarian material here and here, up here. So that fauna continued on, at least so far what we can find. So the Antarctic dinosaurs are a true fauna that existed through this packet of time. All right. But things looked really different than they do now. So very lush environment, as we had said before. It's evergreen, so we're going to have foliage all year round. And plenty of things for our herbivorous dinosaurs to eat which means we have things for our carnivorous dinosaur to eat as well. Okay. So we know that this is a dinosaur fauna and not faunas from two different time periods. Right. So we're able now to say a lot more about our Antarctic dinosaurs than we were ever able to before. Before they were just a collection of taxa. Now we know they belong together. All right, questions? <coughs> 